So number theory will just a number of concepts about addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, which you all know, but we'll, we'll uh, adjust it a little bit from what you, what you commonly think about. And then see a few equations which were useful, and some other properties of numbers which are useful when it comes to public key cryptography. We'll start very simple. We'll talk first about divisibility in prime numbers, and I think you learn even in primary school now that uh, we can talk about one number divides another number. So we can say B divides A if there's some M, some integer M, such that when we multiply by B, we get A. Right? That is, if we can divide and there's no remainder, we say B divides A. And we talk about divisors. So we can say B is a divisor of A. If we can take A and divide by B with no remainder, we say B is a divisor of A. Sometimes we may write that in a short form of B vertical bar A. So we know about divisors. We can then also, given a number has a set of divisors, we can talk about the greatest common divisor amongst two numbers. So A has a set of divisors. B has a set of divisors. What's the greatest of that set? The greatest common divisor, or GCD? And there are algorithms for finding the greatest common divisor. We'll go through a couple of short examples. And a new thing that you may not have heard of, or you can't remember, if two integers, A and B, have a greatest common divisor of 1, we say those two integers are relatively prime. A couple of examples. What are the divisors of 16? Start simple. 2. Is there a number before 2? 1. All right. We can divide by 2. We cannot divide by 3. OK, so simply the divisors. Easy. 24, we can divide by 3, 4 by 6, 3 by 8, 2 by 12, 1 by 24. So that's the divisors. Greatest common divisor of 16 and 24, well the greatest value there is 8. Okay, that's all. We've done this many times in high school, primary school, maybe. 15 divisors, 1, 3, 5, and 15. Greatest common divisor of 16 and 15 is 1. If we look at those sets, 1. So we say there that. 15 and 16 are relatively prime. They're not prime numbers. We'll see them later. But we say that those two numbers are relatively prime to each other. 15 is relatively prime to 16 and vice versa. Because the greatest common divisor is 1. And another thing you probably know is that we can often write well, that's all we've gone there. The next thing we know is about prime numbers. So instead of writing the divisors, we often think about the primes. So what are the primes on the slides? Uh, what's a prime number? Any integer greater than 1, if and only if its only divisors are plus or minus 1 and plus or minus p itself. It can be divided by 1 in itself only. And we can say any integer can be factored into the prime. So the, the divisors can be written as a set of primes multiplied together. So the divisors, we also say the factors. The factors of 15, 1, 3, 5, and 15. So we can talk about prime factors of a number. So some integer a can be written as multiplying a set of primes together. 
prime numbers only. Sometimes there will be multiple primes multiplied together. So we can talk about the prime factors of a number. What are the prime factors of 16? How can we write 16 as multiplying primes together? And let's forget about 1. All right. So what's the first prime? 2. 2 is a prime. It can only be divided by 1 in itself. 1, we, our definition, we consider greater than 1. Okay. So 2... Two to the power of three, two to the power of four. Sorry. All right. Sixteen is two times two times two times two. So its prime factors are two, and so the factor is two, but it's yeah, four times there. Twenty-four is what? What are the prime factors of 24? One's not. Six is not prime. Two and three. Two to the power of three is eight. Times by three is 24. So two and three are the prime factors. We can say 24 is... So in fact, what we can generally do... We can do it for 15 as well. I want to. Three and five are the primes there. In general, any integer can be expressed as multiplying primes together, and sometimes we just uh, list it in a general form, such as here. There's a mistake here. It's not P2, it should be P1 as the first subscript. That is, that some integer is prime 1 to the power of some uh, positive integer, 0, a 0, 1 or, or above, times the second prime. So prime 1 is 2, the second prime is 3, the third prime is 5, and so on. So we can multiply the primes and give some exponent, and that will create any integer. So we'll often come back to prime factors. Some number can be written as multiplying primes together, or the other way, given a number, we can find those factors. What are the prime factors of a number will come up as an important problem. What's the prime factors of 22? Two and 11. 145? There are two, as a hint. Five and... Five times what? Twenty-nine. Five and twenty-nine. So, all right, a little bit more work in the head, but we can prime, find prime factors. And there are algorithms for doing so, and we'll come back to it, but an important point for security is that for a very large number, not 145, but maybe a number with 145 digits, a very large number, it takes a long time to find the two prime factors. That is, if, if we multiply two primes together to get a very large number, given that large number, it's hard to work out what the primes are. And that will be a, a feature of some of the encryption algorithms. What are the primes? You should start remembering some of them, not all of them, of course, but uh, for the simple problems, you can remember uh, the first five or ten. So there are lists of primes you can find. You'll quickly remember them. All right, easy. We can divide numbers. We know something about primes. 
let's do some arithmetic some addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. Of those four operations, well, are there any other operations in arithmetic? Maybe we can expand exponentiation. All right, we add numbers, subtract, multiply, divide, raise to the power, exponentiation, a to the power of b, and the opposite of raising to the power, logarithm. Okay, the, the logarithm of a number is the opposite of exponentiation. So think of those six operations. And you know they're related, so they all go in pairs. Subtraction is, on, is really addition. Subtraction in our arithmetic is adding a negative number. All right, to subtract a number, we add the negative. The negative of a number, we will say, is the inverse, the additive inverse, to be specific. We'll list that in a moment, but we'll introduce and say, if we add the negative of a number, we get subtraction. So subtraction is just addition where we add the additive inverse of a number. And similar, multiplication and division go together. Division is just the inverse of multiplication. That is, to divide, we multiply by the inverse of the number. 10 divided by 3 is 10 times 1 divided by 3, 1 over 3, the inverse of 3. Right, so we can talk about multiplication, and division is just multiplication times by the multiplicative inverse. So we introduce that. And similar, the exponentiation and logarithms go together. And that will become important again when we look at cryptographic algorithms. So I know you can do all those six operations. Now we're going to do it mod n, modular arithmetic. And most of it's the same as your normal arithmetic, but we just mod by n at the end. Well, we know what mod n means. Well, sometimes it's not so clear. Do we have a positive or a negative number? So we will say a mod n, a is an integer, n is a positive integer, is the remainder when a is divided by n. Okay. We refer to n as the modulus. We can say that two integers, a and b, we can think are equivalent we call it congruent modulo n if those numbers mod n are the same. 12 mod 10, 2 mod 10, 22 mod 10 are all congruent modulo 10. They're all the same in mod 10. 2 mod 10 is 2, 12 mod 10 is 2, 22 mod 10 is 2. So we say that congruent modulo n and we'll try and write that as three lines in the equals. So th mo we'll think of mod n as an operator. Some number, mod n. And it returns an answer in the set of 0 up to n minus 1. So mod 10, the answer was always between 0 and 9. No negative values, always positive, 0 to, to n minus 1. So we'll sometimes write that as, as the set Zn. When we perform modular arithmetic, we do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponentiation, logarithms, where the answers are, or the operations are within the confines of that set Zn. So we'll go through some examples of those six operations, mod n. Start simple. Just yell out the answer so we can move along quickly. There's no need to uh, follow the lecture notes, just some examples today.
And to go through these examples, how about the five or six students at the back come down to the front so we can all hear clearly. Come down to the front seats. Let's turn off these two monitors. Plenty of spare, space, spare seats down the front. Then I can hear you when you tell me the answer. We know 13 mod 10, the remainder is 3 when we divide by 10. 13 divided by 10, the remainder is 3. We can say 13 is congruent modulo 3. Uh, congruent modulo 10, they are equivalent. In mod 10, 13 is the same as 3. In the set Z10, the answers go up from 0 to 9. So when we're doing mod 10, the answer is always between 0 and 9. So let's do some addition. And in these examples, we'll do everything in Z10. Everything's mod 10. I'm not going to write the mod 10. Right. So some examples. Addition. What's 4 plus 3? Easy. 4 plus 7? Not 11. 11 mod 10. All right, so everything's mod 10. So in addition, it's easy. We just do our normal addition and then mod the answer by 10. So 4 plus 7 is 1. So addition in modular arithmetic is very simple. It's natural from for our perspective. We just mod the answer by our modulus n. Subtraction. Well, let's do subtraction in uh, over here I'll write the normal normal arithmetic that is our no modulus just normal arithmetic in normal arithmetic what's 7 minus 3 4 or Seven plus minus three. Subtraction is just addition, where we add the negative number. So seven minus three is really seven plus minus three, where minus three, we say in our normal arithmetic, minus three is the additive inverse of three. The additive inverse of a number is the number we add to it such that we get 0. What's the additive inverse of 3? 3 plus minus 3 gives us 0, so the additive inverse of 3 is minus 3. This is our normal arithmetic. Additive inverse since, and I'll write the sign as well, plus 3 add minus 3 equals 0. Therefore, just in brief, the additive inverse, AI, additive inverse of 3 is minus 3. The point being is that we don't need to do subtraction, we just do addition. Subtraction is addition plus the additive inverse. So we just need to find the additive inverse to do subtraction. That's normal arithmetic. Let's return to Z10, everything mod 10. What's the additive inverse of 3? Hmm. 
write it down. Additive inverse of 3. This is in Z10. Z10 means the numbers, the answers, between 0 and 9. So don't give me a negative answer. What's the additive inverse of 3? What number do we add to 3 such that we get 0? Same as here in the normal arithmetic. What number do we add to 3 such that we get 0? Negative 3. 3 plus 7 equals 0 in mod 10. 3 plus 7 is 10, mod 10. So yes, the additive inverse of 3 is 7. Because in mod 10, of course, I haven't written. 3 plus 7, mod 10 is 0. So we can talk about an additive inverse. If we can find the additive inverse, then we can do subtraction. Another one. What's 4 minus 7? Four minus seven is seven. Okay. Four minus seven is four plus the additive inverse of seven. What's the additive inverse of seven? What number do you add to seven to get zero? Well, actually, we just did that. Three, but it was the opposite. That is, the additive inverse of three is seven. Three plus seven equals zero. Therefore, seven plus three also equals zero. So the additive inverse of 7 is 3. 4 minus 7 is 4 plus the additive inverse of 7. Subtraction is just addition, where we add the additive inverse. We know the additive inverse of 7 is 3. So it becomes 4 plus 3. And now we just have normal addition, mod 10, 7. 4 minus 7 is 7. So in modular arithmetic, addition is natural to us. That's easy, I think, for most people. Subtraction is a little bit different from how we think. We need to find the additive inverse. But it's, in fact, the same principle of our normal arithmetic. Two minus six. Find the answer. Two plus the additive inverse of six. Six plus four equals zero. So it becomes two plus four equals six. Five minus three, five plus the inverse of three. We found that before. The additive inverse of three is seven, so it becomes five plus seven. Two. Remember, everything's mod ten. Five minus three is two. All right, that makes sense. Two minus six is six in mod 10. Any questions so far? Yep. There are no negative numbers. All the, the set Z10, mod 10, means the answers are always between 0 and 9. So 
This is the difference between our modular arithmetic and our normal arithmetic. We define the everything is within that set of 0 to 9. So there are no negative numbers. Back to the additive inverse. Let's consider all possible values in our set. We're in Z10. All possible values. A can be 0. There are the possible values that we can operate with with Z10. What are the additive inverses? Zero plus what gives us zero? Mod 10. These are easy. All right, so in this case, every number in our set has an additive inverse. And in general, in any set, in any mod n, every number has an additive inverse. Doesn't matter if it's Z10, Z8, Z1 million, that is, whatever the set, whatever the modulus, we'll always have an additive inverse of each number. Meaning we can always do subtraction, because subtract, subtraction is adding the additive inverse. Any questions before we move on to the next operations? Addition and subtraction, easy so far. What's next? What's the next operation? If we can add numbers, we can subtract numbers, we need to multiply numbers. Multiplying is what? Adding multiple times. So there's a relationship between multiplication and addition. So let's look at multiplication and then division. And let's do it in Z8, just to make it more fun. Three times two. Are you sure? What's the answer? Six. Six? Okay, good. Three times four. Three times four in Z eight is four. Remember everything's mod eight. Remember everything we're just omitting writing the modulus. And the same with 3 times 2 mod equals 6. Mod 8, we still get 6. Multiplication is easy in modular arithmetic. It extends upon addition. We just do naturally our normal multiplication mod by our modulus n. What's the next operation then? We can do multiplication. Next is division. What is division? Multiply by the inverse. Is that in our normal arithmetic? Ten divided by three is ten times one divided by one over three. We can think the inverse of three, not the additive inverse, but we say the multiplicative inverse. So we introduce the multiplicative inverse.
again, this is our normal arithmetic, what we know. Division, 8 divided by 3, in fact, it's the same as multiplication, 8 times 1 over 3. Right? So we can convert division to multiplication, where we say since 3 times 1 over 3 equals 1, therefore the multiplicative inverse of 3 is 1 over 3. This is our normal arithmetic, no modulus yet. The multiplicative inverse is defined as the number we multiply by such that we get 1. 3 times 1 over 3 gives us 1. So 3 and 1 over 3 are the multiplicative inverses of each other in our normal arithmetic. So division, divide by 3, is 8 times the multiplicative inverse of 3. 8 times 1 third. So that holds also in modular arithmetic. Back in Z8, 5 divided by 3. What do you get? Find 5 divided by 3 in Z8. phone calculator may not have this answer. Okay, these are the ones you need to do in your head. 5 divided by 3, 5 times the multiplicative inverse of 3. Let's do the, the full steps. Division is multiplying by the multiplicative inverse. The multiplicative inverse is the number that we multiply by such that the answer is 1. What times 3 gives us 1? In mod 8. So 3 times 3 gives us 9, mod 8 gives us 1. So the answer is 3. The multiplicative inverse of 3 is itself. Because 3 times 3 equals 1. Therefore, 5 divided by 3, continuing, is 5 times the multiplicative inverse of 3, which is also 3, which is... Seven. Five times three, mod eight. Remember, we're all mod eight at the end. For multiplication and addition, just do the mod eight at the end. The easy to solve. Five divided by three equals seven. Any questions before a couple more examples? So think about additive inverse, the number we add to get 0. Multiplicative inverse, the number we multiply by to get 1. Subtraction is adding the additive inverse. Division is multiplying by the multiplicative inverse. Yes. This. This is from our definition 
we want to find the multiplicative inverse of 3. What does that mean? Similar to our normal arithmetic, it's the number that we multiply by that gives us 1 as the answer. Everything's mod 8, remember. Something times 3 equals 1 in mod 8. So something times 3 mod 8 equals 1. What is that something? It's actually 3. It's itself. 3 times 3 mod 8 gives us 1. So we say 3 is a multiplicative inverse of itself. Yes. What other answers are there? In do we need to define the So what right. Uh, the answers remember also always uh, within the set Z eight. So 3 times 3 is 1, mod 8. There's another answer which is, uh, can I think of it? Uh, something times 3, mod 8. Mm. Yes, there, there are numbers greater than 8 that will give the answer, and I can't think of one right now, but there are. But if those numbers are mod by 8, it will come back to 3. All right, so the, the answers or the numbers are always within the set Z8, 0 to 7 in this case. Three times 11 is 33, mod 8 is 1. Right, you found one. 11, three times 11. But what is 11? It's 3 in Z8. In mod 8, 11 and 3 are the same. They're congruent modulo. Okay. So, yes, 3, 11, probably 19, and, and so on. I think when we mod by 8. We, the reason we're doing this is we're working our way up. Addition and subtraction are not so, we don't see them so often in cryptographic uh, operations, but we've moved from addition to, and subtraction up to multiplication and division because they are based upon addition and subtraction. And then the next step is the exponentiation and logarithm, and we'll see that they are commonly used in cryptographic operations, public key cryptography. So that's why we need to learn about the, the principles here. Do you need to show the operations? Yes, sometimes there's a, a, a small question Solve, solve by hand one of these. But usually not such small ones like addition and multiplication. 6 divided by 4. Find 6 divided by 4. There are no fractions, there are no negative numbers. The answers are between 0 and 7. The integers between 0 and 7. How do you find the answer? Well, 6 times the multiplicative inverse of 4. So we need to find the multiplicative inverse of 4. Something times 4 mod 8. We'll write it down in full here. We're in, still in Z8 equals 1. where that something is 0 to 7. No answer. There is no such number. Okay, so 4 does not have a multiplicative inverse.
There's no number between 0 and 7 when we multiply by 4 and mod by 8 and get 1. So there is no answer. Not every number has a multiplicative inverse. Every number has an additive inverse, but not every number has a multiplicative inverse. 4 does not. So we cannot do that. There's, there's no answer. There's no multiplicative inverse of 4. Staying in Z8, so let's list them. What are the multiplicative inverses of the eight numbers? Zero times something equals one. There's no such number. One times something equals one. Nine is not in our set. Remember, our answer is 0 to 7, so 1 times 1. 1 is its own inverse. 2 times something equals 1. Well, we can't get an odd number when we multiply by an even number here, so no such answer. 3 we saw is itself. 4, we don't have an answer. 5, 5 times 5, mod 8 is 1. 6, won't work when we mod 8. 7. 7 times 7, mod 8 is also 1. In Z8, it turns out 1, 3, 5, and 7 are multiplicative inverses of themselves. But it's not always the case. Let's go back to Z10. To, sh to show another case. Zero cannot be multiplied by anything to get one. This is mod ten. Now, one will always be a multiplicative inverse of itself. Doesn't matter what the modulus is. Two. Two won't work. Two times something mod ten gives us a remainder of one. And even multiplied by something else will always give us an even number. We can't get a remainder of one. So the even numbers are not going to work. Three. Three and seven. Three, seven, twenty-one, mod ten is one. Five. No, there won't be a remainder of one when we mod by ten. Seven. We've got that one. Nine. Nine nines. 81. So just a different set of multiplicative inverses. In Z8 they were inverses of, the, of themselves, but that doesn't have to be the case. Right? As we see with Z10, 3 and 7 are multiplicative inverses. And another important point, not all numbers have a multiplicative inverse. So we can't divide by just any number, only by some. Which numbers do have a multiplicative inverse? When the remainder is 1, if the two numbers are relative, if, a, if the number is relatively prime with the modulus, it will have a multiplicative inverse. What's the greatest common divisor of 1 and 10? 1. 1 and 10, the greatest common divisor is 1. 3 and 10, greatest common divisor is 1. 7 and 10, 1. 9 and 10, 
1. 8 and 10, it's not 1. 6 and 10 is not 1. 5 and 10, it's not 1. That is, a number has multiplicative inverse in mod n if that number is relatively prime with n. Relatively prime means the greatest common divisor is 1. That is, we'll not list them all, but greatest common divisor of 1 and 10. We can list them all. 3 and 10. 7 and 10. They're all one. That is, all those numbers are relatively prime with 10, and therefore they have a multiplicative inverse in mod 10. So when we want to do division, we need to know which numbers have an inverse, and we can find them to check if that, by checking if they're relatively prime with a modulus. We can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We can't do division in all cases, only when we have a relatively prime number to the modulus. Let's come back to the slides, see what else we've said. The properties or the laws of our normal arithmetic, there are similar laws of modular arithmetic, and some of them are obvious. Uh, the, these three, for example, a plus B mod N is the same as A mod N plus B mod N, all mod N. And the third one is especially useful. A times B mod N, we can expand out. Be A mod N times B mod N, and then all mod N. Remember, if you mod a number mod N multiple times, if you add A mod N mod N, is the same as A mod N. If you add another mod N at the end, it makes no difference. 12 mod 10 is 2. Mod 10 again is still 2. Mod 10 again, it's still 2. So we can add mod N's at the end, making no change to the answer. This third one is sometimes used to simplify multiplication. When we have large numbers, we can expand out Two large numbers multiplied together gives us a very large number, then mod n. An easier way to solve that is to take those two large numbers a and b and mod n first, which makes them smaller numbers. Multiply two smaller numbers is easier, and then mod n. So that's a common way to, uh, both in our heads, do calculations of multiplication, but also computers can use algorithms or laws like that to speed up the calculation. And there are other uh, laws there. Let's see an example of this, this third rule. And then we'll move on to some other concepts. Staying in Z8. A simple case. We could probably do it in our head, but let's see if you can expand to solve it a little bit easier. 132 mod 8. Well, you could try and calculate what times 8, what's the remainder. But the, the property that we can take advantage of to make it a little bit easier, if we recognize anything about 132, what are the divisors of 132? Something times something is 132, maybe. If you know your times tables. There are some small numbers, but 12 times 11. There are other, other ways to do it. 
but 132 is 12 times 11. So we can expand that. Twelve mod eight times eleven mod eight, all mod eight. Twelve mod eight is four. Eleven mod eight is three. Twelve mod eight, four. Okay, that's just an example of doing this expansion to maybe make it a little bit simpler. Right. Now these numbers you could do it either way in your head. But as the numbers gets larger, especially even for computers, it makes it easier if you expand because these numbers become smaller before we multiply. Try that one. A couple of minutes. Try to expand and, and do it without a calculator. No calculator. Solve that. 11 to the power of 7 mod 13. And try and use the expansion to, to solve it. Just to see how powerful it is. So one approach to this is think, all right, let's make this number smaller. Eleven to the power of seven is eleven to the power of four times eleven to the power of three. Or even better. No, let's stick with that. Eleven to the power of three, I'm not so good at my multiplication, so even that's too big for me. Maybe we can split that up. We'll come across here. I know my squares. I know eleven squared, but I don't know eleven to the power of three, so we can think of that as eleven to the power of four is eleven squared squared mod thirteen. times 11 to the power of 3, I don't know, but I know that's 11 squared mod 13 times 11 mod 13, 11 to the power of 1. And let's not forget uh, a mod 13 at the end. Some of these numbers I can do in my head now. Eleven squared, one hundred and twenty one, mod thirteen. Can someone do that for me? Four. Eleven mod thirteen. Eleven squared mod thirteen. Eleven squared is mod thirteen is four, and then square that again is sixteen mod eleven. Let's leave it in here. Let's just to be complete. 
4, 11 squared mod 13 gives us 4 squared mod 13. Sixteen mod thirteen, we get three times four times eleven. We could probably do that in our head. Twelve times eleven, actually that was before one hundred and thirty two mod thirteen. Divide by thirteen, the remainder is going to be two. Ten times thirteen is one hundred and thirty. Right. The I, the idea of this is that this expansion makes large calculations much simpler. Not just for you in, in a quiz or an exam, but for a computer that has to deal with very large numbers. Very large numbers, maybe hundreds of digits. Not hundreds, but hundreds of zeros uh, of of numbers is that. The length of the number. Multiply them together, calculate the modulus, takes time. So break them into smaller numbers. What's next? That was an example of this property that we could use. And that's the main one we'll see in the cryptographic algorithms. Division we've talked about We've defined additive inverse, multiplicative inverse. Some number has a multiplica multiplicative inverse in n if it is relatively prime to n. So we can do division. In the last 10 minutes, before we, we won't introduce the theorems, we'll do that next week, let's consider another thing. Relatively prime. How many numbers are relatively prime to 10? Back to our examples. How many numbers are relatively prime with 8? One, two, three, and 4. All right, how many? Just counting them. How many numbers were relatively prime with 10? 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, and 4. 4. It's not always four, but let's consider counting the number of numbers relatively prime with some number. Let's get a different color. Start simple. For example, how many numbers are relatively prime with 4? And less than 4. Alright, All right. we'd need to test three numbers. 1, 2, and 3. Are 1 and 4 relatively prime? 2 and 4, 3 and 4. So, relatively prime, remember, means the greatest common divisor of 4 and 1. 4 and 2, so we'd like to count how many numbers less than 4 are relatively prime with it. 4 and 1, greatest common divisor is 1, 4 and 2, divisor is 2, 4 and 3, divisor is 1. These are relatively prime, this one's not. So, two numbers less than four are relatively prime with four. The count of numbers. And we have a special name for this. The number of numbers less than n which are relatively prime with n is called Euler's totient.
Euler's totient function, spelt E U L E R S, the top part here. Euler's totient function, written. So the totient, we say, easier to say, the totient of n is the number of numbers less than n which are relatively prime with n. The totient of 4 equals 2. We did it before. The totient of 8, we had, from our previous example, we had 4. The totient of 10, from our previous example, we counted 4 numbers. What's the totient of 9? Euler's totient function is defined as the count of numbers relatively prime with n and less with n. So the totient of 9, consider the numbers from 1 to 8, check if they're relatively prime with 9 and count how many are. Well, let's One and nine? Are one and nine relatively prime? Yes, one and any number is always relatively prime. Two and nine? Greatest common divisor of two and nine is one. So yes, they are relatively prime. Three and nine? Greatest common divisor of three and nine is three. So no. Four and nine? Greatest common divisor of 1, so yes, I'll give it a tick. It is relatively prime. 5 and 9. 6 has a divisor of 3, so it is 9, so no. 7 is okay, 7 and 9. And 8 is also okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 numbers. Euler's totient of 9 is 6. All right, just to make sure you know what you're doing, let's try uh, another number. We'll not write it down. 1 and 13, yes, 1 and n always relatively prime. 2 and 13, think of the greatest common divisor. Greatest common divisor between 13 and 2. Is it 1? If so, relatively prime. 2 and 13 are relatively prime. How many numbers less than 13 are relatively prime with it? All of them. 12. Okay. Because, because of what? 13 is a prime number. By definition, then all of the numbers must have a greatest common divisor with that number, the prime number of 1. So the numbers less than 13, which are relatively prime with 13, 1 through to 12, so there are 12 numbers. So that's a nice shortcut. The Euler's totient of a prime number is the prime number minus 1. If you recognize 29, it's a prime number. Totion is 28. So if we know n is a prime number, we can quickly calculate the totion. Very easy. If it's not a prime number, then, well, we saw the algorithm on our small numbers. We could check the numbers. Right? We go through and check them. If it's a prime number, 
We don't have to check them. We know straight away that if 29 is prime, the answer of Euler's totient of 29 is 28. But if it's not a prime number, we need to check. And it turns out that there are no fast algorithms for checking. The algorithms that people know of for checking these, basically you need to try them all. And that takes a long time when n is very large. That will become a, another security property we use in cryptography. A couple more to, to finish for today. Totion of 7. It is prime. Totion of 5. Five is prime. Totion of 35. 35 is a prime? No. So what are you going to do? You could try numbers one compared to 35, two, three, up to 34 and compare them all. But we do notice 35 has two prime factors of 7 and 5. And it can be easily shown that the quotient, or the totient, not quotient, totient of two prime factors multiplied together is the totient of those numbers multiplied, running out of space. Totion of 7 we know is 6. Totion of 5 is 4. The answer is 24. So we, we have n. n is 35. If we can factor it into the two primes, in this case 7 and 5, then it's easy to calculate and it's, you can check the math. It's not hard to show that the totion of two numbers multiplied together is the same as the totion of each number and then multiply. And since it's easy to find the totion of the two primes, 7 and 5 is 6 and 4, it's easy to find the totion of 7 times 5, of 34, 35. This is a property that we'll make use of in security as well. And the, it will come down to how easy is it to find the totion of a number? a large number. If it's a prime number, yes, very easy. Just the prime number minus one. If the number is made up of multiplying two prime numbers, also very easy. In this case, it's made up from multiplying two prime numbers, so we can quickly find the totient. If not, it's very hard. We basically need to try all the numbers. And if we have to try a large number of numbers, it will take too long to try them. And that will be a security property we see in public key crypto. Those properties are listed here. The totion of 1 is 1. Right, that's a definition. For prime p, the totion of p is p minus 1. We saw that. And this property we just saw. The totion of n, when n is made up of multiplying two primes, p and q, is p minus 1 times q minus 1. We'll take advantage of that as well. Next week we'll see some further theorems that take advantage of some of these properties. And then we'll move on to public key cryptography and see an algorithm that uses these properties to make it secure.